All right, High Desert Church, how you doing? I hope uh, that you are comfortable, but not too comfortable. I know it's hard to sometimes pay attention in the setting of your living room or wherever you're at. Um, I even have to, you know, sometimes stand up, walk around, so I get it. But we're so glad you're joining us again, continuing in our series on Acts. And I'm excited. Today we got a lot to cover, so we're going to be going after it. We got 41 verses to cover. So if you have your Bibles, grab those, pull those open to Acts chapter 2, and that's where we're going to be resting, those first 41 verses. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I've been excited to hear and, and think about is all of the different things that are going on through your ministry at your little church campus, at your homes, in your sites, with your neighbors. I mean, we hear stuff all the time at High Desert Church from what's going on through small group networks and other things, and we are excited to see how God is using you during this time because he's going to use you in ways that you didn't expect and we'll talk about that today even, how some of the people in the beginning of the church didn't expect God to move in the ways that he did. And they, they had no clue what was coming. Remember, Pastor Tom introduced us a few, you know, last week to this idea of this is right after, probably right after 40 days Jesus was walking around on the earth. And today what we're going to be talking about is the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Passover, which means 50 days after Jesus died and then rose again. So this is tight, this is close, but they were still in a little bit of an upheaval, didn't know what was going on, didn't know what to expect. They knew they were supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, and that's what they were doing, but they had no idea what was gonna happen next. Today we're gonna talk about that event of what happened when the Holy Spirit came. And there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, different things that we'll be talking about today, but what I want you to do is think about your family, think about your oikos, think about your home. Think about what are you expecting God to do right now? Or are you expecting him to do anything in this time of digital distance? Like, you know, we're not in church. We're not able to, to see each other lifting hands of praise. We're not able to shake hands and, and connect with our fellow believers. You know, I've got a lot of people at my campus that I'm missing that I haven't seen for, you know, five, six weeks. And it's, it's not fun. But you know what? God is still going to do something. And we can be expecting that, and we can be excited for that. And, and so when you think about how the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about that showed up back then in some, in some strange ways, honestly strange ways, he's there with you now in your home. He's here with me. He's with my family. He's with all the other families that are watching, all the people, whether you're by yourself or whether you're gathered with a large group of people. He's with you. And he can do some amazing things to those that are willing to submit their life to him and give him authority over their thinking and change their actions and then have them reach out to the front row of their life to their oikos. And so pray with me if you would. You can gather as a family, you can hold hands, you can keep your distance if you want, use hand sanitizer, whatever you need to do, uh, but let's pray. Lord, thank you for the chance to be continuing in this series and... Uh, even though this is not normal, like what we, we consider normal, it seems to be becoming normal, Lord. But Lord, I pray that you'd give us a hunger to see how you're gonna move and change and do things despite uh, what our you know, governments say, despite what this virus causes fears in us, despite all of those things, Lord, that you would just give us an expectation of you moving in our worlds because we trust you. And so, Father, we thank you for loving us. Jesus, we thank you for coming, for dying, for rising from the dead, for ascending to the Father, showing that we can draw near to God. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who's come to us. And it's in God's name we pray, amen. Well, commissioned, the idea of, you know, uh, how a generation changed the world. The book of Acts, a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, where Luke described in detail what went on with Jesus after he looked intently and sought to verify everything that he heard, and he wrote about that, and then he continues by writing about the church, the beginning of the church, what was going on, and how the whole thing started. We talked about last week, they were gathered and, and, and Jesus left and he gave them some instruction. He said, look, the kingdom, it, it's not coming yet, but it will be coming and it's coming to you and it's coming in you, so wait for the Holy Spirit. And they chose, uh, in, at the end of chapter one, they chose the, another apostle to fill out the, the 12 and, and Matthias. We don't hear much about him for the rest of the book, which is interesting, we don't have time for that. Uh, but we start with chapter two 
And, and chapter two is all about how religion has to go by the wayside and the empowerment of the spirit of God in you has to come up. And what do I mean by that? Well, I looked up Google. We got lots of time to be on the computers and phones these days, right? And so I looked up, what is, what is the definition of religion? And, and I found one that was interesting, the English language learners. It's the belief in God or a group of gods, okay? Belief in God or a group of gods or the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods. Now it's interesting because there's an informal definition too, and it says that an interest, a belief, or an activity in a very important, that is very important to a person or to a group. Very important to a person or a group. The interesting thing about religion, and you may have heard the tagline, right? Like Christians like to say, oh, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Now, I I get that. You're trying to nuance the idea, um, but that doesn't necessarily land always with with non-believers or or pagans. They're kind of like, okay, that sounds like a cop-out to me. What we mean by that is, right, that we don't have this systematic way that we are relating to God. We actually have a personal way that we're relating to God through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and that is how we relate to God, and that is very different than a religious system. Because a religious system tells you a bunch of actions to perform, but a personal relationship actually draws you towards themselves through love and interaction. And I want to encourage you, the Holy Spirit is just as active today as what we're going to read back then. Now, maybe not in the same ways, but in different ways, he's active in your hearts and in your minds, but you got to listen for him. And when you listen for him, then you leave religion behind. So let's get into the text because we got a lot to cover. Acts chapter two. I want to point out what do you have to do when you leave religion behind? There's going to be just four simple points. And it's, it's what you can expect because we're talking about expectation. What you can expect when you leave religion behind. The first one is you can expect the unexpected. Now, I know you aren't filling things out, and many of you, if you printed them out, you're so awesome and you're so type A. We love you. Print those things. Fill those out. Expect the unexpected. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. Wouldn't that be nice? Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, it came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, I don't want this to be lost on you. You're sitting in what was the day of Pentecost was uh, the day of first fruits. It was 50 days from Passover, that, therefore the Penta, the 50 days past Passover. And it was this festival, this feast of weeks or the feast of first fruits where they were supposed to bring the first fruits of their harvest and they were present it before God and have it burned up. And then that would be a symbol to God that they are trusting him for their future. And then in the middle of this, they're in an upper room and they're all getting together, gathered. And all of a sudden this this vision, this thing comes down of something that looked like, and it's hard to know, but it was a flaming tongue of some sort. Or flaming language that divided and separated and rested on each of them. Very strange occurrence. Now, many people want to talk about what is the gift of tongues and how does that relate to this? Well, Pastor Tom actually on Monday is going to be talking through the the gifting of tongues and what that is and maybe how that's nuanced differently than this and and all of that. So join him on on Monday through through our Facebook pages and all that. Pastor Tom will be there sharing that and he'll kind of explain a little bit of that. I'm not gonna do that today. What I am gonna do is point out that this seems to be very closely referencing languages, actual languages in other languages as it reads. That same word, this glossia, this tongue, separated tongue, it was divided tongue. It's used in the rest of the passage just talking about language in general. They heard them in their own language, and so we'll read that. 
But could you imagine being in that room with your friends and with people that you just lost your leader and he was crucified and then he rose again, if that wasn't strange enough, and then he ascended into the clouds, disappeared after giving you a charge, and then you're supposed to wait around and you're sitting on the day of first fruits and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit rushes in like a blowing wind. And there's some manifestation of, of some flaming thing that then rests on you and then all of a sudden you start talking but you're not talking in the language you're accustomed to. You're talking in a language that you have never heard of. If that's not unexpected, I don't know what is. And God was doing something here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but he was doing something here with this language barrier being broken. Some see it as a reference to the Tower of Babel being demolished and things being brought back together in unity. I don't know that there's a lot to that, but what I can say is this is a way that God is showing, look, I am here to spread my good news. I am here to tell of this sacrificial lamb that was the Passover, that was the ultimate Passover, that was Jesus that came, that died, that rose from the dead and wants people to come under his headship and live in his kingdom in expectation for what he will do. And I don't want anything to be a barrier to that. I don't want language. I don't want race. I don't want any of that to be a barrier. There's something very unifying about what happens here but it's also unexpected and it's strange. And I don't know about you, but I wasn't necessarily expecting to be preaching to a camera. I, I, you know, what was it, 50 some days ago, I wasn't expecting any of this, but here we are, it's unexpected. But God can use it, God can use it. You know, God moves in a lot of unexpected ways in our lives all the time, and we have to be careful to pay attention to it. I wanna share with you just a story of a friend of ours. Um, actually, Matt Curtis, you, you know Matt, he's on the beginning of these, uh, these sermons and, and the beginning of these services every week. But Matt's, Matt's wife, Amy, has, has struggled with, with health, health issues for, for a lot of her life. And I just said, Amy, why don't you write me a paragraph about how God has shown up in unexpected ways in your life? And so here's what Amy wrote. See, health issues... Asthma in particular have been part of my life since early childhood. In high school, I was hospitalized. I missed several months of my junior year. One night in the hospital, I felt so completely devastatingly alone. Unable to breathe without significant help and, and in more pain than I had ever felt before. And it was there that I realized that God was all I really had and that he was enough. Fast forward 30 years, the issues came back, which culminated one day on a particular poignant drive to another doctor's appointment where I was trying to figure these things out. When I decided it was time that I needed to let my husband know all of my passwords, all the locations of important documents, and other crucial things that he might need if I don't make it through this time. You know, we were living through such a unique combination of preparation for what we were facing while prayerfully trusting God that he was good, and that he loved us, and that he was more capable of getting me through this, and that he was enough. And whenever I made it through or not, that he was enough. So over the next several months, God answered our prayers for my healing, and things stabilized. And we were so incredibly thankful but then God kept going, working his healing hand and beyond anything we had the audacity to ask or imagine, he was so much more than enough. I still have difficulties that arise, don't we all? But, but having witnessed firsthand how wonderfully surprising God can be, I now expect him to show up in surprising and beautiful ways in my life. Sometimes in seasons are hard, really hard, kind of like now. But remember that he is always more than enough. And if you keep your eyes expectantly looking for his hand, you will see it. Thanks for sharing that with us, Amy. And we're rejoicing that you are feeling better and doing well. But I want you to know in your living room, wherever you're at, God can do things that you didn't expect. God can do things through you that you didn't expect. As we're gonna see what happened with these folks. 
that God wants to do the unexpected because we want to expect, we want to put God in a little box and say, well, here's the thing. Just like religion tells me, if I respond to you this way, you're supposed to respond to me that way. That's not how our God works because he's not in a system. He's in a relationship with you through the person of Jesus and through the empowerment of the spirit of God. And so remember, when you leave religion behind, you can expect the unexpected. The next thing that you can expect is that you can expect culture to push back. You can expect that it won't always be easy. Even like Amy said, everything's not perfect now, but you know what? It's getting better. It's getting better. And so let's look at the next section in chapter two, verse five. Now there was staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And they heard this sound and the crowds came together in bewilderment because each of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans, which is another way of saying, aren't these guys uneducated? They don't know what's up and yet they're speaking in our language? Like they're from the north, they're fishermen. What's up with that? Now, how is it that they are teaching us and we are hearing them in their native language? Parthians, Medes, a whole list of a bunch of names that I can't uh, pronounce, so I'm gonna skip those. Skip down to verse 11. It says, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in our own languages. It's the same term used for this divided thing that came down flaming and rested on each of them. And here's where it goes. So they said in verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What do we do with this? But some, however, some, however, made fun of them, mocked them. And they said, these group of Galileans, these fishermen, man, they've had too much to drink. That's what's going on here. You see, God was doing something amazing here where he was bringing, everybody had traveled in for the day of Pentecost to offer their first fruits. And he chooses this time and this place to say, you know what, I'm gonna declare the message of the gospel of Jesus, the good news that he died and rose and that they can come to me through him. No longer through the temple, remember the curtain torn in two. But now they can come through the person. And I'm telling all these people, And many were amazed, but some were saying, they're drunk, that's ridiculous, this is foolishness. You see, what you can expect if you leave leave religion behind is that people will think that sometimes you're foolish. People will think that sometimes you're crazy. People will think sometimes you're not doing what expectations you should be doing to fulfill some sense of growing towards God. I remember a time in my life when I went to Victor Valley College, go Rams. Actually, I don't even know. Is that the right? Yeah, I think that's the right one. So I was in a philosophy class. Now, I was going to Victor Valley College because it's cheap. I mean, at that time, it was like 11 bucks a unit. It was awesome. And I knew I was going to go on to Bible college. And so I wanted to talk to, um, at a break, I was talking to, to Dr. Henry. That was his name. And he asked why I was going to school. And I told him, well, I'm, I'm planning on going to Bible college. And so this is just my transition. And then something changed in him immediately. Our interactions changed completely. A few weeks later in class, we were talking about determinism. And it's uh, the idea of how God has already determined things and that we have no choice in the matter. And he was trying to bait me into a conversation. And I wouldn't go into the conversation. He said, well, this is what they believe about God, that God chooses people and he chooses those and he pushes the others away. And that's that. And he said, Brian, what do you think about that? I said, well, that, that seems like a pretty good representation of that. And I just shut my mouth. Fast forward a couple other weeks, and he became so frustrated with me that at one point, he actually kicked me out of the classroom. And it was a surprise to everyone. The other students in the class actually took notes on my behalf for the test, and they gave them to me afterwards because he was pushing back simply because I was a Christian. No other reason. I actually had an A in his class. It wasn't like I was a goof off. Sometimes the people in your life will push back but you better make sure they're not pushing back because you're acting like a fool or because you're not acting like what is in line with godly character. Because if they're pushing back for that reason, they have all the reason to push back in the world. 
something we can notice. They said, look, these guys are drunk. A couple things we can notice from that. One, drunkenness and foolish actions are pretty common and have been known throughout history, so be careful how much you drink. Number two, people may look at you in the way you respond to God, in the way that you offer help to others, in the way that you give what you may not have, in the way that you offer up money uh, to the church to, to be given to God so that God can use it, and the amount of money that you give to the church, and they may look at you if they ever found that out, and they might say, dude, you're acting like somebody who's drunk, you're foolish, what is that doing for you? Here's the thing, it's not about you. It's not about you. Expect them to push back because they don't understand. But remember that when they push back, that can have you push forward. Push forward into them. And so the next, uh, the next point I wanna bring to your attention is this. The thing you can do if you, relieve, if you leave religion behind is that you can expect your message to be bold. You can expect your message to be bold. Peter stood up, verse 14 of chapter two. He stood up with the 11. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And I want you to pay attention. I'm gonna just rifle through this because I think this sermon is awesome. And it's the first sermon of the book of Acts. And it's kind of the, the template for the way the sermons throughout the book of Acts are gonna be rehearsed. And I want you to notice, and I'm just gonna point out where the boldness is. But here, uh, the reading of the word of God. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Pay attention. I'm being bold here. These people, they're not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Nobody drinks at nine. It's not five o'clock somewhere. It is nine in the morning. They're not drunk. Now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God, he will pour out, I will pour out my spirit on all peoples. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour my, out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Prophecy, by the way, is also mostly warning, not necessarily future telling. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. It's very reminiscent of the first giving of the law and of when God filled the temple the first time in the tabernacle, which by the way, the New Testament claims that we are the temple of God, the people of God. Verse 20, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon and the blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israels, listen to me, I'm being bold. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves have seen, this was only 50 days ago, and the years before that, Jesus was doing these things. And with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on a cross. And I missed a very important verse, because I want to stop here a second. We often think about how they would put him and nailed him on a cross. But verse 23 is so important. It says, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. This wasn't a surprise. It was an unexpected turn of events, but it wasn't a surprise. And it says that they put him to death, they nailed him on a cross, Verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord and he was before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Same term, my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let the Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of my life, and I will be filled with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, Peter continues, I can tell you confidently, because I'm bold, that the patriarch David, he was buried, that he's in a tomb to this day, and he was a prophet who knew God, had promised him an oath that in one day 
In his place, one of his descendants will be on this throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. He's referring to what he just read as he quoted Psalms, a David psalm, where it said that I will see, I will not be allowed to decay. And he's saying that wasn't David talking, that was David talking about the Messiah. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we were all witnesses to it. Exalted him to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he has poured that out. And what you now see and hear is that thing. For David did not ascend to heaven. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the enemies, your enemies, a footstool under your feet. You see, Peter's quoting David, who was quoted by Jesus earlier in the book of Luke in chapter 20, saying, look, the Messiah wasn't just a person. The Messiah was God. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now that's a bold statement. He's in Pentecost. He's in the feast of gatherings. He's in a time where they are giving the first fruits to the Lord, that same term, the kurios, and they are still looking for the Messiah. And he says to them, look, this Jesus that was crucified by you, by Jews, he's the one that we were looking for. He's the one that we were expecting. He died, but he rose from the dead. And because of that, God proves that he is Messiah. And so pay attention to my boldness. Verse 37, when all the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what, what shall we do? What do we do with this information? I understand what you're saying and I don't even speak that language and, and now I hear it in my own tongue and you're telling me this is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit like Joel was talking about. And all of that doesn't line up and make sense to me, but something in my heart is, is turning and, and so I wanna say, what do I do, brothers? What shall we do? And here's what he replied. He didn't reply, oh, you know what? You need to start coming to church with us. Oh, you know what? You need to start changing your behaviors. Here's what he replied. He replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, under the authority of, coming under submission to the Jesus, to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit also. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. You see, if we leave religion behind, then we can step out in boldness with the message of Christ. The boldness of the message of Christ is this, that you are condemned under the weight of sin, that there is punishment that follows because of that one day when you will stand before God. However, Jesus came he did not sin, and yet he was killed as if he had sinned because the wages or the result of sin is death, and yet he did not stay dead. He rose from the dead, and as he rose from the dead, he took on <clears throat> and conquered death and sin, and he offers it to you if you will draw near to him, if you will come under, if you will turn away from the old things, that's what repent means, and you will come towards him then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you will be renovated. That's a bold message. Some people in your front and row don't need to hear about how God is promising you that you will be fine through all of this. He is promising you that. But you know how he's promising you that? Because he already rescued you through Jesus. You will be fine because at the end of all things, at the end of days, you will, I, those that have placed our faith in Christ, we will be vindicated as someone who is righteous, though we are not, but he is. And that's a bold message. It's a message that says you can't earn God, but God offers himself to you freely so that you might come towards him. And when you do, and the Holy Spirit enters your life, you will walk and you will move towards him. You see, the boldness of Peter 
and his message can go right to us. Notice all of those lines. He did not cut any words. He didn't say, oh, you know what? Well, <clears throat> the Jews, they didn't really know what they were doing. And you guys are all Jews, right? You didn't know what you were doing. He just said, look, you guys killed him through Rome. But here's the thing. He rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, you too can be changed. And God is calling everybody from far off to draw near towards himself. That's the bold message that we carry as Christians. That's the bold message. And if we are not taking that message, just simple, that message to the people in our world, then all we're doing is dancing around the idea that one day they will stand before their God and have to answer for the sins committed in the body. Just like we will. And I will be able to stand there with Jesus, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, and be able to say, Lord, I have sinned, but you are enough, even as Amy proclaimed. And when you're enough, you cover my sins, Lord. That's the message that we have. Religion will give you a bunch of things you need to do. The message that we need to be bold with is the fact that God wants to renovate your heart, but you can't get, give him just a piece. You have to give him everything that you are. You have to trust him. And so we can learn from this that, that he said, look, this message, it's simple and it's bold. And I want you to notice what, what Peter did not say. Real quickly, he did not say, <clears throat> Rome is gonna be destroyed. He did not say, you're all gonna get rich. He didn't say that if you follow Jesus, everything's gonna work out in this present world. He didn't say that you'll be healed from every pain, every sickness, that you always have a job, that you always get along with your kids, that homeschooling would be easy, that all of the separation would be fun. He didn't say any of that. What he said was that you will be made right with God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit will dwell with you and he will empower you and change your life and your perspective in ways that you did not expect. And people may push back, but I wanna tell you something. With him, we will move forward. And that brings us to our final point, is that we can expect God to move if we leave religion behind. We can expect God to move. Let's finish up the chapter. I know we've been rolling through it fast. There's so much more I would love to share with you because this, this sermon is rich. The sermon is so rich. Read it over and over again. Look into it. See what the Lord wants to reveal to your heart, to your family. Read it as a family. Just the sermon part. And see what God might show you. But let me continue on and we'll just finish it up here. Verse 40. So with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Now I have to stop for a minute because I want you to notice something. He says, with many other words. They said, what do we do? That was where it ended, right? Verse, verse uh, 39. What do we do with this? With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. That word pleaded, um, it's, 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 uh, it's the same word that is used of the Holy Spirit. It's the verbal form, paraclete, uh, parakletos, plerikeo. Uh, parakaleo is this ver form right here. And what it means is that you are calling out, you are coming alongside, you are comforting, you are pleading, you are trying hard. That you are listening, that you are praying that you are investing, that you are inviting into conversation, that you are preparing to change your world. Because you're, you're coming alongside, you're calling out, just like the Holy Spirit. You see, the funny thing is, is we can expect God to move. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, then he can, through us, accomplish his purposes. Not because of us, but through us. But we have to be a willing vessel. We have to participate. We have to come alongside. With many other words, Peter did not give up. Peter was telling them, listen, pay attention. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and following, there's this, there's this great depiction of Jesus walking alongside someone who was his follower. <clears throat> and it said, he opened up uh, Moses and the prophets and he spoke about all of the things in the Bible that talked about him. And I'm sure, I can't even imagine what Peter was saying. I would have loved to have seen this whole scene where Peter was pleading and explaining to them, look, just like in that case where Jacob's ladder, there was uh, the, the angels were descending and ascending on him. That's how Jesus is like. Just like the rescue from Egypt where they were 
rescued out of slavery. That's what Jesus is like. I can imagine all of the things that he was explaining and pleading with them because he said, you know what? I'm gonna reckon that if I now know the Holy Spirit is dwelling with me, that God is going to move. And I'm not gonna be okay with someone saying, you know what? That was cool, man. I mean, I like that magic show and all that, but I'm really not interested in church. Well, that's fine, man. You don't have to be interested in church. You have to be interested in someday you got to stand before God and Jesus wants to stand before God on your behalf. You see, that's the message that's bold. And when we're bold, God will move. So what happens? He's pleading with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Man, Peter continues with the boldness. And he says, look, Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What an amazing turn of events. God shows up, drops on them the Holy Spirit. They start speaking in other languages. Some people push back. Other people wonder what is going on because they heard this bold message. And then God moved in a miraculous way where 3,000 people responded to God. It's interesting because at the first giving of the law, 3,000 people actually were killed because they had disobeyed the commandment of the Lord and the Levites put the sword to them. It's very interesting. If you want to look in Exodus um, in the 30s, read the whole 30s. It's all good. Read it all. But I want, you, I want you to see something. If we expect God to move, we can expect that then in your world, in my world, if we will commit to living out the oikos principle, daily paying attention and doing those things. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us who helps us list the right people, who helps us pay attention to who's in the front row out of those eight to 15. And that we can expect God to move. Now, I'm not saying that 3,000 people are gonna come to know the Lord if you go out and preach on the corner. But what I am saying is it doesn't matter because if God is dwelling with you and the Holy Spirit is within you, then you should be telling the message of Christ. Why? Because you're excited about it. The kingdom is coming. We've seen a risen Lord. We celebrated it. For us, just a couple weeks ago. For them, 50 days ago. And I wanna, I wanna encourage you. Now, we've been looking at how God is moving and doing things, even in this time of quarantine. Um, Matt had, had shared with us, Matt Curtis had shared with us just some amazing things that are happening through church services um, being online, that there's a bunch of churches that have, have come into this new world of online church for a time. And best we can guess from different pastors that he's talked to, there's been about 208,000 people that have come to know Jesus in the United States through the ministries of these churches. Now that's amazing. Now take that and double that by eight to 15 or times that by eight to 15 and there's your real number of how the ministry of Jesus is being spread. But here's another number. There's been about 6,500 of us that have been continually coming to, to church services for the last five weeks. And I wanna suggest to you that if you will just push into over the next 20 years of your life, two people coming to know the Lord through your ministry as you oikocentrically think about things. That if there's 6,500 of us and everybody, two people over 20 years, that would be 13,000 new people that come to know Jesus. Now that's pretty amazing in and of itself. But I'm giving you 20 years. Does that seem impossible? Does that seem hard? That over the next 20 years, that because you are devoting yourself to prayer, that you are devoting yourself to investing, that two people could be connected to Jesus through you. Now let's back that up. What if, what if I said you did that in 10 years? And then not only did you do that in 10 years, but then the people in your world continued that in 10 years. And so in 10 years, you've done 13,000. And then in the next 10 years, that 13,000 becomes what? It becomes 26,000. And then that 26,000 then doubles again over the next 10 years. And that becomes 52,000. So we have 10, 20, 30. Now, remember, the generation, the book of Acts, how the world changed in the generation was 40 years span 
That means at the end of 40 years, there would be 104,000 people that came to new Jesus because of 6,500 people that committed themselves to the oikocentric living. But that's only the direct line from you. The last part of your notes, I put that formula on there for you. And it says that 6,500 HDC people with 40 years of focused personal mission. This is important because if this doesn't happen, then this doesn't happen. That equals over 1 million more Christians in this world. Now, I don't know about you, but that is showing that God is on the move and that we can be excited about that because us, the people of Hyde as a church, those of you sitting in your living rooms watching right now can be part of something bigger Part of something, if you leave religion behind and if you take on expectation for the unexpected that God's going to do amazing things, that I will, regardless of pushback, that I will be bold in my message and I'm going to look for where God is moving in my 8 to 15 and all I need to really look for and all I need to push for is two people over the next 10 years and over that next 10 years, if two people come to know the Lord, the potential is over a million people hearing the message of Jesus. People, that's exciting. That's our message. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the fact that your word is so bold, that it's straightforward, that it's direct, that we can see how boldness translates into your movement through people. And we can get excited about what you're doing. And Lord, I pray for the hearts of us as we sit in our homes as we try to figure out how to do this life now and hopefully things are loosening up and and many folks maybe have lost jobs or, or, or lost hours, Lord, I pray that you would comfort them, that you would bring them courage, you would bring them strength, you would help them trust in you and in trusting you that they will speak the message of the gospel to those around them. And perhaps you're watching today and And you've never made a confession of faith. You've never actually trusted in Jesus. I want to challenge you. There's no other option for you to be saved. That one day you will meet your maker. One day you will stand before him and you will answer for the things done in the body. And I want to suggest to you that you already know that you would admit that you didn't do things right all the time. But here's what God offers is that if you believe in Jesus, that his Payment on the cross was enough for you that you can come to the knowledge of him, that you can give your life over to him, that if you believe that he died for you and you believe that he rose again, that he can show how he will draw you near to the father so that that day comes when you stand before him and you're standing right there with Jesus and the Holy Spirit will come and dwell with you. But it takes more than just believing it. You have to choose. You have to choose to follow him. And so it's simply making that prayer, that confession of your heart. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I need a savior. I believe that Jesus is my savior. By dying on a cross and raising from the dead, he can bring me to you. And I choose to follow after him. I choose to let him change my heart and mind. And you become a Christian today. Please share that with us. You can mark the welcome form. And we want to rejoice with you. And the rest of us, Lord, those of us that know you, Lord, help us be excited about what you're doing through your Holy Spirit, dwelling in our hearts and in our minds and reaching out on the move to the world around us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.